أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القاعلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يبركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا والطبيب نفوسنا والشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العص والزمان خليفة الرحمن ما ملنس والجان ولعن الله وعداهم جمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين جاهدوا والذين جاهدوا فينا لنحذينهم سبلنا وإن الله لا مع المحسنين صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم First of all, let me send my condolences to the Imam of our time to the Maraje, to all of you on the arrival of the day of Arba'in May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your grief, accept your tears, use that grief, use that emotion that we have now felt for the past 40 days, including the, the grief we feel today, to be a catalyst for change, to be a trigger for a revolution, inshallah. The images out of Iraq are incredible in a very hostile environment during a global pandemic. There are people who are running towards Karbala. Some are flying, some are on boats, some are walking, some are in cars. Any possible way to arrive on the blessed land of Karbala, they will do it. And this movement, this harara, this this fire, this energy that the Prophet talks about that is inside the hearts of the believers for Imam Hussein, we see it in the beautiful streets of Iraq. Well, the people of Iraq now are welcoming the zawar and the visitors of Imam Hussein. Every year I make the same point, I'll make it here as well. There's two types of begging that we see. One begging is that I want you to give me what you have. So if you have money, can you please give it to me? If you have food, can you please give it to me? If you have, I don't know, shelter, can you please give it to me? I want what you have. I want what you have. The other type of, of begging is actually the reverse of that. I don't want what you have. I want you to please take what I have. Subhanallah. I'm begging for you to please take it what I have. We see now up and down this walk from Najaf to Karbala, the people of Iraq are lined up. Some have full meals, some have water bottles, some have fruit. Some offer tissue paper, and if they have nothing to their name, they simply offer their hands to massage the shoulders and the feet of those who are the guests of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. This reverse begging, they would beg you, please take what we, what we have. Even if it's one piece of a tissue a, or a Kleenex or a napkin, I could say to say the Fatima that your za, or the za'ir of your son Hussein took something from me. This love, this jazba, this energy, this harara, this fire will never be extinguished as the Prophet says. And so we beg to Allah, we, we, we plead to Allah, we ask Him. This azadari is the source of our pride. It's our identity, it's our salvation, provided that we emulate 
and not simply admire. The past two nights now, we've been looking at spiritual elitism with all of you. And two nights ago, three nights ago, no, two nights ago now, sorry, we looked at the concept that sometimes we think, or people like me think, that I can do the bare minimum in this world. But because I was born a Shia, I was born a Sayyid, I was born whatever the case may be, I have an easy journey waiting for me in the hereafter, and I don't want to be... I don't want to be somebody who will be surprised or shocked. And one of the biggest takeaways from that is, from, from, the, from the discussion two nights ago, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a merit-based God. And if He gives out of His grace, He gives because we've earned it. Now, if He decides to double that, triple that, quadruple that, that's up to His grace. But that initial giving of rewards, the initial bestowing of the blessings happens based on our merit, what we have earned. Don't be like those, يَرْجُوا لَا خِلَةَ بِغَيْرِ عَمَلِ Imam Ali says, you have hope for the hereafter, you have hope for the hereafter, but you have that hope without doing anything for it. Don't be like the Bani Israel tribe who are telling Musa, Musa, you go. Anta wa rabbuka faqatila. You go and fight these people. We'll be here, sitting here. Or Idun will be right here waiting for you. Let us know when the coast is clear. We will now enter the country. No. Everything requires effort. Everything requires amal. You have to walk the walk and talk the talk. You have to actually do something to earn something. And last night... We talked about the idea that we don't want to be those individuals that now you know, have this ego or this idea that I'm better than somebody, I'm higher than somebody. Because the reality is, like I said last night, you know, if, if uh, uh, we begin to actually tread the path of emulation, then that will humble us. We don't want any sort of shorat or, or fame or recognition. I just want to drown myself into the Ahlul Bayt's. And allow them to lead me towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we truly emulate the Ahlubit, and that's the, that's the statement that I'm going to keep repeating. The source of salvation, the path of salvation, the reality of success in the hereafter travels through a path of emulation, not admiration. Of course we admire them. Of course there's fada'il. Of course there's distinction. All oh, the stories of the Zulfiqar of Imam Ali. The stories of the akhlaq of this Imam and that Imam. Beautiful, beautiful akhlaq. Goosebumps. We have this warmth inside of our heart. But if I may, with all due respect, the enemies had the exact same admiration. The non-Muslims had admiration. For us, it's simply not enough we're asked to emulate, not just admire. And last night we talked about micro-compassionate acts, small acts that will humble you. The more you do zahmat, the more you do khidmah, the more you serve other individuals with the smallest of acts, the tiniest of acts, the more now this idea of spiritual elitism will enter inside of you or, not, you or I. Now in tonight's discussion, my last discussion with all of you, what I'm asking all of you to do is very difficult. And I'll tell you why. It's difficult because we live in a consumerism era. We live in an era where... The customer is always right. The customer is treated like God. That if the customer wants a certain uh, product, wants to customize it, wants to change it, right? Instead of blue, I want green. Instead of one, I want two. If I'm ordering a certain dish, let's say, for example, in a restaurant, instead of, I don't know, onions, can I have mushrooms? Instead of chicken, can I have beef? Instead of spicy, can I have it mild? And they'll say, look, sir, as long as your credit card clears, as long as you have the cash, oh, we'll do whatever you want, sir. <laughs> can you remove this, add this, double this, triple this, lighten this? Sure, you can. No problem. 
and you end up now becoming a person where you believe that everything has to revolve according to what you want. Now that's fine because customer right now in this consumerism era, and uh, really always, customer was always right. The customer is always right. The problem is that we've allowed this consumerism to trickle into our ibadat, into our worship into our du'as, into my connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I should be able to customize the deen to fit my life, customize Islam to fit my life. I should be able now to ask Allah for something, and within 24 hours, like my package that comes to my door, should be at my door, Allah's du'as. And I've reduced Allah's du'as and Allah's prayers to a transactional experience, not a transformational one. If I order something online, it's a certain size, a certain color, uh, uh, you know, I'm expecting it to be here within 24 hours. If I have the right membership and it comes, it's the wrong size, the wrong color, the wrong quantity, and it comes two days late, I'll be annoyed. If that happens enough times, I'll simply stop ordering from this company. That's how we are sometimes with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, I've been asking you for how long for this dua? There's no sign of it now. I asked you for a summer wedding, you gave me a winter wedding. I wanted my first child to be a girl, you gave me twin boys, for example. I didn't want to marry this guy, end up marrying him, for example. I didn't want, to, I didn't want my first house to be, a, a, I don't know, an apartment, a condo, a flat. I wanted to be this, that. Everything I asked for, you gave me the opposite. After a while, we'll, start, we'll, we'll simply stop asking Allah. Because, hey, he's not giving me what I want. And to fight through that, and to hold on to our iman in this consumerism, glamorization era of social media, everything is public, everything is open, we're open books now, nothing is sacred anymore. For us to not fall into the trap of the me-centric life, to not feel elite sometimes with any possible reason for me to feel elite and better than anybody else, I'll take it because we live in a very individualistic world. This world of fad girai, as they say in Farsi, individualism is rampant, I'm sorry. Like I said last night, those small acts of worship going out of your way for somebody else, putting yourself in a little bit of discomfort for somebody else, is a lost art nowadays. Few and far between. People will look at number one first. How will this impact me, affect me? And I'm not saying to put yourself in detriment. Imam Hassan al-Mushtaba, alayhi salatu wa salam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi If, for example, he had some assets or something in his I apologize. <clears throat> My throat is a little bit bothering me. I'm trying to avoid coughing, actually. <laughs> um... If he gave anything away to those who were less fortunate, he didn't give it all away, he gave half of it away, right? My teacher will always say, look, if you have $2 in your pocket, give one to the, the, the guy who needs it and keep one for yourself and for your family. I'm not asking you to always be in a place where you are you know, in dire need, right? That you save someone else's anxiety, but you place yourself in anxiety, right? You feed someone else's family, but you starve your own. No, of course not. But a little bit of zahmat, a little bit of out of your way, a little bit of out of your comfort zone, driving two blocks a little bit out of your way, isn't going to be the end of the world. Those acts, those micro-compassion acts now, does what? Breaks the egotistical idol inside of us. Now, what I'm asking all of you to do is struggle. Is struggle. It's not easy what I'm asking all of you to do. Especially my millennial and Gen Z guys. It's not easy at all. It's very hard. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala up and down the Quran now talks about struggle and striving. I think sometimes what we don't understand is that, you know, when we hear sometimes from the member, from the pulpit, that Allah wants perfection from us, Allah wants kamal from us, Allah wants us to be perfect. I think sometimes we think that that means for me to be infallible, sinless, a ma'asum. No, it does not. 
What it means as a summary of a summary of a summary, it means that we should not ever stop trying to be a better person. The effort and the struggle is our perfection. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a process driven creator, not always and only exclusively a result driven creator. I've given the example before, I'll give it right now. Nabi Nuh alayhi salam, Nabi Nuh, Prophet Noah, for 950 years, almost a thousand years, propagated the message of Allah. Told to people, told the people about God. Tried to, tried to convert them to be those who believe in the uniqueness and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a thousand years of effort, I think eight, maybe 80 at most, answered his call. 80 individuals across a thousand years. Do the math, that's not a lot of people across a thousand years. <laughs> the average is very, very low. If God was result-driven, he would say, Nabi Nu, you're fired as a prophet. I need somebody who can make proper sales for me. I'm going to give you a, simple, a, a silly example. Not only does he accept the process of Nabi Nu, he makes him an Ulul Adam prophet, one of the great five. So my point is that if I'm asking you to do this, to humble yourself, to look inwards, to not be those that walk around with, a, a, with your chest out and two inches off the ground, looking down on other ideologies, other sects of Islam, right? Looking at their leaders and looking at their rules and their fiqh, fiqh discussion and their ahkamat and saying, oh, that's wrong, they're ignorant, they're illogical, right? Meanwhile, in the process, I think I'm better, I'm better. I haven't done anything. What have you done? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants struggle from us. And there are moments in the Quran where he is very general in terms of struggle. Laysa lil insani illa ma sa'a that man is nothing but what he strives for. Man is nothing but what he strives for. It is a very important statement. I want my youth especially to digest this statement. The human being is known by what it struggles for. If you struggle for shaitan, you become known as that. If you struggle for God, you become known for that. If you struggle for this world, you become known like that. And you can actually see those individuals who live their life to please this world, to somehow attain this world, you can absolutely see their lifestyle. Then there are those that while they're living in this world, they're trying to attain the hereafter. That struggle is also there in front of them. There's no, I mean, there's no hiding it. Okay? There's no hiding it. لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى It's not a matter of you struggling or not struggling. It's a matter of what you struggle for. There are many of you right now in school, and you have this dream of whatever profession you want to be, but you also know, I have to, I have to make sure I ace this exam, I have to make sure that I, I, I get this certification and get, and, and get this many hours and get this and get that, right? That requires effort, that requires effort, that requires effort. And the beautiful part for me is that I know that a lot of my young guys today, they can do this, accept Islam as a challenge in today's day and age, to be pious and spiritual and walk away from social norms is a challenge. It's not easy. I'm not here now painting a picture of roses. There's a lot of thorns on that rose, on, on those roses, for sure. And you're bound to, get, bound to get pricked sometimes. But accept that challenge. Step up to the plate. Show your strength. Historically, the young people have always shown this incredible amount of of resolve, determination, courage, resistance, resiliency that we haven't seen in others. 
It seems as if the first ones now to say Labbaik and answer the call of anyone who's on the path of Haqq and righteousness are the young people. We go all the way from the Prophet of Allah through, through Karbala and to the Imam of our time. One constant denominator, one constant is young, young, young. I've seen you guys. I've seen you fight your urges. I've seen you fight for your life. I've seen you work hard and become professionals. I've seen you try to work through a bad marriage. I've seen you, you know, struggle with the idea that you've been jobless for a few months. I've seen you get your health back together. I've seen you transform your souls and your bodies. I've seen so many things. And I'm amazed by every single moment that I see a young person now striving to be a better version of themselves. You'll be known for that struggle, Laysa Lil Insan Illa Masa'a. In another very famous verse from Surah Maida, Allah says, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, ittakullahu wa abtughal ilayhi wasila, wa jahidu fi sabilihi la'allakum tuflihun. O you who believe, if you want to be successful now, three ingredients piety, God consciousness. Seeking a, a path of nearness to God and wajahidu fi sabilihi on God's path, there is a struggle. A struggle. You want to sit there and arrive in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, scars upon scars. You've been going to battle with shaitan. Sometimes he gets the best of you, sometimes you get the best of him. But regardless, you have been in a battle constantly from the moment that you had your aql turned on and turned on to your very last breath in this world and god knows that and god sees the fact that wow all the signs of you being in battle are there in front of you but at least at the end of it now can you say that i still say la ilaha illallah remember after the war of badr the holy prophet now gave this beautiful khutbah and sermon to the families of those who were shaheed in the war of badr the first official war between the enemies of Islam and Islam. So that was a prime moment for the Holy Prophet now to describe the maqam and level that a martyr has achieved in the eyes of Islam. Also to give them some, content, some contentment, some comfort, some healing that your son didn't give their life in vain. They're actually enjoying a very beautiful akhir, a beautiful hereafter. After that khutbah, Imam Ali was a little bit upset. The Prophet sensed this. What's wrong, Ali? Why are you upset? He says, Ya Rasulullah, why was I deprived in this war from this maqam of shahadat, from this level of martyrdom that you're describing? And that's when he says to, to Imam Ali, Ali, your white beard will be drenched with your own blood one day. You will taste shahadat, you will be a martyr, you will be shaheed in this world. And the question of Imam Ali's is a prime question that is related to our topic today. He says, Ya Rasulullah, subhanAllah. When my beard is dripping with my own blood, will I be on the path of submission to Allah or not? <laughs> where will I be at the end? After my battle with the dunya, where will I be at the end? I mean, the Prophet of Allah, up and down his 23 years, he made it very clear that I completely entrust some big, major responsibilities to young individuals. I'll give you a few examples. Ja'far al Tayyar, the brother of Amir al-Mu'manin, the son of Abu Talib, the very first man to lead a tablighi propagation mission for Islam to Abyssinia, present-day Ethiopia and Africa. The Prophet sent 80 plus people with, 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 with Jafar. Go meet the king there. He's a, he, he's a good king, a good man of God. Go talk to him and seek asylum inside Africa. Tell them about the Quraysh and what they're doing to, uh, to us in Mecca. This is a monumental mission. It's huge. It's the first export of the deen from the peninsula. And he trusted Jafar, who was in his early 20s, early 20s. And the list goes on. Bilal Habashi's first Adhan after Fatih Mecca, 18 years old. 
Mus'ab ibn Amir, who was the first man now to go to Yathrib before it was Medina, convert those tribes, lead the first Jama'a prayer in Yathrib, sign, a, send a letter to the Prophet of Allah to now migrate from Mecca to Medina, so now it can go from being Yathrib to Medina to Nabi, the city of the, of the Prophet. All of that was built on, uh, uh, on Mus'ab. Mus'ab was 19 years old. Amir al-Mu'mineen up and down all those great war stories, all the tales of the Dhul-Fiqar, from Badr to Uhud to Khaybar to Khandak, to all those wars that we get all warm-blooded about, it really makes us feel, oh my yeah, these are six stories. He was in his 20s, in all of it. The day of Ghadir, the only complaint they had against the Prophet's announcement was that he was too young to lead this government. Because back then, older was wiser, older was smarter, older was more, more, more respected, older was more capable. It is still today, but back then it was to the point where, uh, you know, the wider the beard, the more they're able to handle anything possible. Here you had a 33-year-old Imam Ali who would tie his shoes with a rope, who would break his bread over his knee. That's how rough it was. And this is going to be your representative, your successor in this empire. And the Prophet says, have I not shown you and told you that, look, age is nothing to me. It's the state of the heart. It's the resolve and the resiliency of the youth that have now shown me that it's possible now for me to give them these crucial roles and they succeed in those roles. All of you can do what I'm asking you to do. I know you can. You have it in you. I have met and I have spoken to some of the most inspiring youth these past two, three years. The way they've navigated through a pandemic, the way they, they, they've now created their own uh, programs, their own circles, their own movements, all in a virtual world. They didn't allow the pandemic to, 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 to cripple them, to stop them. They used what they could to move the deen forward. Incredible, incredible. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the third instance of struggle in the Quran, we talked about a general struggle, لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى We talked about a little bit of a more struggle, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي سَبِيلِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِهُونَ And the third level is the ayat that I've been reciting for you in the khutbah for the past three nights from Surah Ankabut. For the one now who struggles in our path, Allah says. Now it's a very specific struggle. It's a very specific struggle. If you do that, I will, I will guide you, open up the paths for you. There's so much ta'kid in that, Arabic grammar-wise. Emphasis, the lam is emphasis, the shadda on the noon at the end is emphasis. There's all sorts of emphasis, meaning hatman sadda sad, for sure, for sure. Usme koi shak everything. I will make sure I open up doors for you, provided, however, waladina jahadu fina. You struggle, but you struggle in our way, in our path. You say no to all those satanic thoughts inside of you. Absolutely. It is a struggle. But it is that initial struggle that God wants. Surah Talaq, the one now who the one who is God conscious, the one who shows this idea of being God centric, the one who has now the belief in Allah inside of him. If you are able to show the one woman you're able to show that God consciousness, you meaning you now instigate that first step. I will give you a solution, I'll give you an outlet, I'll open up doors for you. And I will give you rizq, I'll give you sustenance from a source that you never even accounted for. One door closes, another door that you never even thought was a door to begin with opens up. You have a thousand stories, God knows I do about, about this verse. 
But the first step of all of that is one man yattaqillah. You have to be God conscious. When they ask you about me, God says, tell them I'm near. Look, I'll give you a very simple example. Those of my parents out there who have young children. Let's say, for example, you are teaching your child how to walk. Okay? And I don't know how any of you do it. The way that, the way that we did it was we put our, our, our son or our, 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 our child a little bit away from us. And we had some toy, a ball, something he liked that we knew he liked. Maybe a chocolate, maybe some sort of candy. And, you know, he, and we enticed him, kind of luring him into far from us. So you can see now, he stands up now, he gets his balance now, and he begins to walk one step two steps. After the one step, after the, 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 the second step, he stops, he begins to wobble a little bit, and just as he's about to fall, you lunge and you grab him. You make sure he doesn't fall. But that only happens after he took the first step or two. If you grabbed him on the onset of this whole exercise, it would just be foolish. You're trying to teach him how to walk. Let him figure it out. So he took the first step now. After one, one and a half steps, he's about to fall now, and you grab him. That's how God is. God says, look, take that first step towards me. Even at the age of 16, 18, 21, my young guy is out there, one tiny inch towards him. If you haven't prayed Salat in God knows how many days, pull out the Janamas and that one four-minute Salat al-Zuhr, that one three-minute Salat al-Maghrib, do it. And sit on the musalla for about two minutes. Tasbih, dua, talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first step that, that, that he wants from you. The rest he will do. The rest he'll take care of. It's a matter of us believing it. It's a matter of us struggling for it. I'm not here to, 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 to paint you know, a painting of roses. Absolutely not. But I am here to say that God now will give you 10 times more than you could expect provided you make the first move. He's not going to force anybody. He's not going he, he, to try to sit there and take over anybody. No. I've shown you the path. You know what's right and what's wrong. This nafs of yours has been divinely inspired between fujur and taqwa, between right and wrong. You know what's right and what's wrong. You know what to do. It's a matter of execution. That's where we lack, in execution. On paper, in our mind, in our thoughts, everything looks great, sounds great, makes complete perfect sense. But when you convert to everyday life, then it becomes very difficult. That's why I talked about those small micro acts last night. It's the small everyday acts of worship. It's the smile for your children. It's saying salam to your family first. It's making sure that you give a little bit of sadqa every single Friday. It's the iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in 10 times a day. It's a micro, but that's what God wants. Small acts done consistently. So if we want to remove and avoid the idea of spiritual elitism to enter inside of our, our system, we have to ensure that we embrace the struggle. This is not an all or nothing category. It's not like, look, if I can't perfect every aspect of religion, there's no point in me trying. Remember, if something is worth it, it's worth it even if it's done imperfectly. If something is worth it, and Islam is definitely worth it, it's worth it even if, even if it's done imperfectly. Okay. You want to make dinner for your family. You're not the cook. You're not, you're, you're not the cook, but you know that your spouse has had a long day outside the home. They're gonna, they're gonna come home starving. So you're, you know what? Let me go ahead and make. And surprise them and make a full course meal. So you do. You make whatever you know how to make. 
be it pasta, some salad, I don't know what the case, what, what, what the case may be. And by the time they come home, there's a nice fresh meal on the table. They're surprised, they're in love, they're so happy. Oh my God, you made my day. But the food wasn't that good. <laughs> it didn't have any salt in it. There was no taste in it. The chicken was not even cooked properly. But you know what? It was worth it. It was worth it. We live in a black and white world sometimes. We live in a, in a, in a switch on and switch off world. And the deen is a lot of things, but the deen is not black and white. <laughs> Perfection is very relative. Your path is your path. Likulli shay'in tariq, the Prophet says. Every shay has a tariq, has a path. It's a matter of you embracing that path. Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam knew exactly what he was doing when he left Medina and Mecca. He was on a mission. Every step of the way he struggled. It's the day of Arba'een. I'm seeing these images coming out of Karbala on social media, people, the ulama, those who have gone, family members, friends are all sending me this clip and that clip and, you know, my heart, if I could right now transport myself to Karbala, I would. But the love you see, I saw one man who had no legs pushing himself towards Karbala. Not even a guarantee of the dhari of Imam Hussain. If I get to the dome, I say, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Abu Abdullah, that's enough for me. Three days of me walking towards Karbala, 80 kilometers long. I'm tired, it's hot. My feet have blisters all over it. Enough, I could see the dome. I said my salam from far. I turned around, I went back home. What is this love? What is this love? And this is that day now where Zainab has been reunited once more with her brother. As I said last night now, the Qafullah now is led outside of the courtyard of Yazid. They have left Sham now. They're on their way towards Karbala. Zainab says, I want to go back to Medina, but I want to go through Karbala. Why would you want to go back to that place? That's nothing but horrible memories for you. There must be some trauma there as well. But Zainab simply wanted to cry for her Akhi Hussein, without somebody lashing her, without somebody hurting her. But now we are at those, those days of Arba'een, the first Zahir of Imam Hussein, the first pilgrim of Imam Hussein, is one of the most oldest companions of Rasulullah, Jabir ibn Abdullah Ansari, arrives on the plains of Karbala. Jabir is a very old c companion. He saw five Imams in his lifetime. By the time he arrived in Karbala, they say he was bi blind. So he's there with his servant Atiyah, Atiyah al Aufi. They arrive on the plains of Karbala. Jabir goes straight to Farad and pre pre prepares himself for his ziyarat. He says to Atiya, Atiya, help me now. Help me to locate the grave of my Akha and my Mawla Hussain. Atiya says that Jabir, there's all these graves here, but they're all unmarked. I have no idea which one is Hussain's grave. He says, Atiya, just place me where there are the most graves, I will find the grave myself. Atiyah now leads Jabir around a number of graves. Atiyah stands there and three times in the plains of Karbala, he calls out, Ya Hussain, Ya Hussain, Ya Hussain. How is it possible that a lover now is calling out for his beloved, but that beloved doesn't answer the call? I'm calling for you, Hussain. 
I've come to send my salams to you, Hossein. But then Jabra goes on, how could you answer me? How could you answer me? Your body has been trampled. Your head has been severed. There's 200 plus wounds. The enemy now did such a, such a horrible level of oppression on you. How could it be that you could answer now? Jabra sitting at the grave of Imam Hussein, picking up the khak of the grave, the dirt of the grave, putting it on his head, begins to cry. Sends his salam to Hussein. Atiyah then says, Jabir, there's a qafla coming from a distance. There's a caravan coming from a distance. He says, now can you describe that caravan? Yes, there's black flags everywhere. There's lots of women. They're all wearing black. Jabir says, is there any men in that caravan? Atiyah says, there's one man, but he looks like he's very, very zaif and very weak. His back is bent. There seems to be a scar on his neck. Can you take me there? Jabir doesn't doesn't uh, understand it, the, the, doesn't recognize it, the, the, the the description now he's brought in front of this man now and this man is sitting there and Jabber says to this man now I don't recognize what my servant is describing who are you where you're from this man now picks up Jabber now says Jabir Ana Ali ibn al Hussein you don't recognize me I am your fourth Imam Imam said Jad Jabir falls at the feet of Imam Sajjad. Mawla, what is this description I hear? Your beard is white. Your back is bent. There's scars up and down your body. Imam Sajjad picks up Jabir, embraces. They cry for a very long time. Jabir, do you know what they did to my father on the day of Ashura? Do you know what they did to Abul Fazil Abbas? Do you know what they did to my Akhi Ali al Akbar? Do you know how Hormala how Hormala sent that arrow to Ali Asghar. And one by one, Imam Sajjad began to empty his heart out to Jabir. After such a long time, he's found one of the Prophet's companions. Can you imagine that moment for Imam Sajjad? They begin to cry and weep together. It's at that moment now, just two more minutes, I promise you. It's at that moment now where Imam Sajjad says, Jabir, move aside. My puppy, my Zainab, my aunt Zainab is coming to do the ziyarat of her brother. Hussein up now approaches the plains of Karbala. The last time she was here, 70 steps away, Omar bin Saad, Had al Hussein. Zainab approaches the the grave of Hussein, collapses on the grave. Baya, I'm back from Sham, Baya. I took your message to the bazaars of Kufa and Sham. I gave my khutbah in Sham. I made sure everybody knew exactly why you did what you did. But my heart is also a little bit restless. Why is your heart restless, Zainab? Tell Hussein, why is your heart restless? Baya, you left me an amanat on the day of Ashura, your four-year-old Sakina, Zainab, this is my Sakina, look after her, hey Baya, I've come to Karbala, but I left your amanat in the Zindan of Sham.